All right, guys. Hello. Welcome back. Hopefully you guys can still hear the tunes. Um, definitely don't, obviously I don't want it to be super loud. So you guys can, you'll, you guys are going to have to adjust, or, let's go! Um, you guys can just let me know how the music is sounding. Um, I want it to be heard, but not super loud. Oh, let me change. You're right, you're right, I should. Okay, hang on. I got you, I got you, I got you. Everything's fine, this is fine. This is fine. Wanna stay warm, obviously, but we need the proof rock prep. Remem memento mori, remember you will die. So, we good. Boom. Oh, you can see my t-shirt. Oh well. It's weird to do this like backwards. Okay. Changing clothes. I was trying, I wasn't meaning to be inappropriate. My apologies if I was. Changing, yeah, changing sweatshirts, that's all. Can you guys hear the music? Quietly in the background. I just shoved three tacos down my throat, did a load of dishes and a load of clothes, or towels, technically. <clears throat> but if everything sounded nice to you guys, I'm probably just going to jump right on in. Quietly, yes, perfect. If it gets too loud, tell me in chat and I will try to fix it as soon as I am checking chat again. I'm trying to get comfy on my chair. All right, <clears throat> we have chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 to get through. Five chapters. That's right, Tara, I did do that. You can't hear the music when I'm talking? Okay. This song's a little bit louder, so tell me if you can hear it at all while I'm talking here. This song that just... I'll wait until I hear update because this song's a little bit louder than the last song was. Um, so you can let me know how it is. You hear it now? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Is it distracting? Just let me know. Yeah, the last one was kind of a quiet song. Not distracting. Cool, cool, cool. All right, we're going to jump in. <clears throat> Chapter 9. Occasionally, events in one's life become clearer through the prism of experience, a phrase which simply means that things tend to become clearer as time goes on. For instance, when a person is just born, they usually have no idea what curtains are and spend a great deal of their first months wondering why on earth mommy and daddy have hung large pieces of cloth over each window in the nursery. But as the person grows older, the idea of curtains becomes clearer through the prism of experience. The person will learn that the word curtains, what the, the person will learn the word curtains and notice that they are actually quite handy for keeping a room dark when it is time to sleep and for decorating an otherwise boring window area. Eventually, they will entirely accept the idea of curtains and may even purchase some curtains of their own or Venetian blinds, and it's all due to the prism of experience. Coach Genghis's SOAR program, however, was one event that didn't seem to get any clearer at all through the Baudelaire Orphan's prism of experience. If anything, it grew even harder and harder to understand because Violet, Klaus, and Sunny became so utterly exhausted as the days, and more particularly the nights, wore on. After the children received their second message from Carmelita Spatz, they spent the rest of the afternoon wondering what Coach Genghis would make them do that evening. The quagmire triplets wandered along with them, so everyone was surprised. The Baudelaire's, who met Genghis out on the front lawn after dinner again, and the quagmire's, who tiptoed out of the recital and spied on them in shifts from behind the archway again, when Genghis began blowing his whistle and ordered the Baudelaire orphans to begin running. The Baudelaire's and quagmire's thought that surely Genghis would do something far more sinister than more laps. But while a second evening of running laps might have lacked in sin sinisterity, 
<clears throat> Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were too exhausted to notice. They could scarcely hear the shrieks of Genghis's whistle and his cries of keep running and another lap over the sound of their own desperate panting for breath. They grew so sweaty that the orphans thought that they would give up the entire Baudelaire fortune for a good long shower. And their legs grew so sore that the children forgot, even with their prism of experience, what it felt like to have legs that didn't ache from thigh to toe. Lap after lap, the Baudelaire's rain ran, hardly taking their eyes off the circle of luminous paint that still glowed brightly on the darkening lawn, and staring at this circle that was somehow the worst part of all. As the evening turned to night, the luminous circle was all the Baudelaire's could really see, and it imprinted itself into their eyes so they could see it even when they were staring desperately into the darkness. If you've ever had a flash photograph taken, and the blob of that flash has stayed in your view for a few moments afterward, then you're familiar with what was happening to the Baudelaire's except the glowing circle stayed in their minds for so long that it became symbolic. The word symbolic here means that the glowing circle felt like it stood for more than merely a track, and what it stood for was zero. The luminous zero glowed in the Baudelaire minds and it was symbolic of what they knew of their situation. They knew zero about what Genghis was up to. They knew zero about why they were running endless laps, and they had zero energy to think about it. Finally, the sun began to rise, and Coach Genghis dismissed his orphan track team. The Baudelaire stumbled blearily to the orphan's shack, too tired to even see if Duncan and Isadora were sneaking back to their dormitory after their last shift of spying. Once again, the three siblings were too tired to put on their noisy shoes, so their toes were doubly sore when they awoke, just two hours later to begin another groggy day. But, and I shudder to tell you this, this was not the last groggy day for the Baudelaire orphans. The dreadful Carmelita Spats delivered them the usual message at lunch and they, after they spent the morning dozing through classes and secretarial duties, and the Baudelaire's put their heads on the cafeteria table in despair at the idea of another night of running. The Quagmires tried to comfort them, promising to double their research efforts, but Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were too tired for conversation, even with their closest friends. Luckily, their closest friends understood completely and didn't find the Baudelaire's silence rude or discouraging. It seems impossible to believe that the three Baudelaire's managed to survive another evening of sore, but in times of extreme stress, one can often find energy hidden in, in even the most exhausted areas of the body. I discovered this myself when I was woken up in the middle of the night and chased 16 miles by an angry mob armed with torches, swords, and vicious dogs, and the Baudelaire orphans discovered it as they ran laps, not only for that night, but also for six nights following. This made a grand total of nine sore sessions, although grand would seem to be the wrong word for endless evenings of desperate panting, sweaty bodies and achy legs. For nine nights, the Baudelaire brains were plagued with the symbolic luminous zero glowing in their minds like a giant donut of despair. As the Baudelaire orphans suffered, their schoolwork suffered with them. As I'm sure you know, a good night's sleep helps you perform well in school. And so if you are a student, you should always get a good night's sleep unless you have come to the good part of your book, and then you should stay up all night and let your schoolwork fall by the wayside, a phrase which means flunk. In the days that followed, the Baudelaire's were much more exhausted than someone who'd stayed up all night reading, and their schoolwork did more than fall by the wayside. It fell off the wayside, a phrase which here has different meanings for each child. For Violet, it meant that she was so drowsy she did not write down a single word of Mr. Ramora's stories. For Klaus, it meant that he was so weary that he didn't measure a single one of Mrs. Bass's objects. And for Sunny, it meant she was so exhausted that she didn't do anything Vice Principal Nero assigned her to do. The Baudelaire orphans believed that doing well in school was extremely important, even if the school happened to be run by a tyrannical idiot. But they were simply too fatigued from their nightly lapse to do their assigned work. Before long, the circle of luminous paint was not the only zero the Baudelaire saw. Violet saw a zero at the top of her paper when she was unable to recall any of Mr. Ramora's sto stories for a test. Klaus saw a zero in Mrs. Bass's gradebook when he was called on to report the exact length of a tube sock he was supposed to be measuring and was discovered to be taking a nap instead. And Sunny saw a zero when she checked the staple drawer and saw that there were zero staples inside. This is getting ridiculous, Isadora said when Sunny updated her siblings and friends at the start of another weary lunch. Look at you, Sunny. It was inappropriate to hire you as an administrative assistant in the first place, and it's simply absurd to have you crawl laps by night and make your own staples by day. Don't call my sister absurd or ridiculous, Klaus cried. I'm not calling her ridiculous, Isadora said. I'm calling this situation ridiculous. Ridiculous means you want to laugh at it, said Klaus, who was never too tired to define words, and I don't want you laughing at us. I'm not laughing at you, Isadora said. I'm trying to help. 
Klaus snatched his drinking glass from Isadora's side of the table. Well, laughing at us doesn't help at all, you cake sniffer. Isadora snatched her silverware from Klaus's hands. Calling me names doesn't help either, Klaus. Mum dum Sonny shrieked. Oh, stop it, both of you, Duncan said. Isadora, can't you see that Klaus is just tired? And Klaus, can't you see that Isadora is just frustrated? Klaus took off his glasses and returned his drinking glass to Isadora. I'm too tired to see anything, he said. I'm sorry, Isadora. Being tired makes me crabby. In a few days, I'll turn as nasty as Carmelita spats. Isadora handed her silverware back to Klaus and patted him on the hand in forgiveness. You'll never be as nasty as Carmelita spats, she said. Carmelita spats? Violet said, lifting her head from her tray. She had dozed through Isadora and Klaus's argument, but woken up at the sound of the special messenger's name. She's not coming here again to tell us to do laps, is she? I'm afraid she is, Duncan said ruefully, a word which here means while pointing at a rude, violent, and filthy little girl. Hello, cake sniffers, Carmelita Spat said. Today, I have two messages for you, so I should really get two tips instead of one. Oh, Carmelita, Klaus said, you haven't gotten a tip for the last nine days, so I see no reason to break that tradition. That's because you're a stupid orphan, Carmelita Spat said promptly. In any case, message number one is the usual. Meet, Co meet Coach Genghis on the front lawn right after dinner. Violet gave an exhausted groan. And what's the second message, she said? The second message is that you must report to Vice Principal Nero's office right away. Vice Principal Nero's office, Klaus asked. Why? I'm sorry, Carmelita Spat said with a nasty smile to indicate she wasn't sorry one bit. But I don't un answer questions from non-tipping orphan cake sniffers. Some children at the neighboring table laughed when they heard that and began banging their silverware on the table. Cake sniffing orphans in the orphan shack! Cake sniffing orphans in the orphan shack! They chanted as Carmelita Spatz giggled and skipped off to finish her lunch. Cake sniffing orphans in the orphan shack! They chanted while the Baudelaire sighed and stood up on their aching legs. We'd better go to Nero's, Violet said. We'll see you later, Duncan and Isadora. Nonsense, Duncan said. We'll walk you. Carmelita Spatz has made me lose my appetite, so we'll skip lunch and take you to the administrative building. We won't go inside, otherwise there'll be no silverware between any of us. But we'll wait outside and you can tell us what's going on. <clears throat> I wonder what Nero wants, Klaus said, yawning. Maybe he's discovered that Genghis is really Olaf all by himself, Isadora said, and the Baudelaire smiled back. They didn't dare hope that this was the reason for their summons to Nero's office, but they appreciated their friend's hopefulness. The five children handed their scarcely eaten lunches to the cafeteria workers, who blinked at them silently from behind their metal masks and walked to the administrative building. The quagmire triplets wished the Baudelaire's luck, and Violet, Klaus, and Sonny trudged up the steps to Nero's office. "'Thank you for taking the time out of your busy orphan schedule to see me,' Vice Principal Nero said, yanking open his door before they could even knock. "'Hurry up, come inside. Every minute I spend talking to you is a minute I could spend practicing my violin, and when you're a musical genius like me, every minute counts.'" The three children walked into the tiny office and began clapping their tired hands together as Nero raised both his arms in the air. "'There are two things I wanted to talk to you about,' he said when the applause was over. "'Do you know what they are?' "'No, sir,' Violet replied. "'No, sir,' Nero mimicked, though he looked disappointed that the children hadn't given him a longer answer to make fun of. "'Well, the first one is that the three of you have missed nine of my violin concerts, and each of you owes me a bag of candy for each one. Nine bags of candy times three equals twenty-nine! In addition, Carmelita Spatz has told me that she's delivered ten messages to you, if you include the two de that she delivered today, and that you've never given her a tip. That's a disgrace. Now, I think a nice tip is a pair of earrings with precious stones, so you owe her ten pairs of earrings. What do you have to say about that? The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another with sleepy, sleepy eyes. They had nothing to say about that. They had plenty to think about that because they'd... That they'd only missed Nero's concerts because Coach Genghis had forced them to. That nine bags of candy times three equals 27, not 29. And that tips are always optional and usually consist of money instead of earrings. But Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were too tired to say anything about it at all. This was another disappointment to Vice Principal Nero, who stood there scratching his pigtails and waiting for one of the children to say something that he could repeat in his nasty, mocking voice. But after a moment of silence, the Vice Principal went on to the second thing. The second thing, he said going on, is that you have... Th that y hmm. Is that you three have become the worst students Proofrock Preparatory School has ever seen. Violet, Mr. Remora tells me that you flunked a test. 
Klaus Mrs. Bass reports that you can scarcely tell one end of a metric ruler from another. And Sonny, I've noticed you haven't made a single staple. Mr. Poe told me that you were intelligent and hardworking children, but you're just a bunch of cake sniffers. At this, the Baudelaire's could keep quiet no longer. We're flunking school because we're exhausted, Violet cried. And we're exhausted because we're running laps every night, Klaus cried. Galuka, Sonny shrieked, which meant, so yell at Coach Genghis, not us. Vice Principal Nero gave the children a big smile, delighted he was able to answer them in his favorite way. We're flunking school because we're exhausted, he squealed. And we're exhausted because we're running laps every night. Galuka, I've had enough of your nonsense. Proofrock Preparatory School has promised you an excellent education, and an excellent education you will get, or in Sonny's case, an excellent job as an administrative assistant. Now, I've instructed Mr. Ramora and Mrs. Bass to give comprehensive exams tomorrow, large tests on absolutely everything you've learned so far. Violet, you'd better remember every detail of Mr. Ramora's stories, and Klaus, you'd better remember the length, width, and depths of Mrs. Bass's objects, or I will expel you from school. Also, I've found a bunch of papers that need to be stapled tomorrow. Sonny, you will staple all of them with homemade staples, or I will expel you from your job. First thing tomorrow morning, we will have the test and the stapling, and if you don't get A's and make enough staples, you'll leave Proofrock Preparatory School. Luckily for you, Coach Genghis has offered to homeschool you. That means he'd be your coach, your teacher, and your guardian all in one. It's a very generous offer, and if I were you, I'd give him a tip too, although I don't think earrings are appropriate in this case. We're not going to give Count Olaf a tip, Violet blurted out. Klaus looked at his older sister in horror. Violet means Coach Genghis, Klaus said quickly to Nero. I do not, Violet cried. Klaus, our situation is too desperate to pretend not to recognize him any longer. Hifiju, Sonny shrieked. I guess you're right, Klaus said. What do we have to lose? What do we have to lose, Nero mocked. What are you talking about? We're talking about Coach Genghis, Violet said. He's not really named Genghis. He's not even a real coach. He's Count Olaf in disguise. Nonsense, Nero said. Klaus wanted to say nonsense right back at Nero in Nero's own repulsive way, but he bit his exhausted tongue. It's true, he said. He's put a turban over his eyebrow and expensive running shoes over his tattoo, but he's still Count Olaf. He has a turban for religious reasons, Nero said, and running shoes because he's a coach. Look here. He strode over to the computer and pressed a button. The screen began to glow in its usual seasick way and once again showed a picture of Count Olaf. You see, Count Olaf, Coach Genghis looks nothing like Count Olaf, and my advanced computer system proves it. Yushalo, Sonny shrieked, which meant that doesn't prove anything. Yushalo, Sonny, Nero, mocked. Who am I going to believe? An advanced computer system or two children flunking school and a little baby too dumb to make her own staples? Now stop wasting my time. I will personally oversee tomorrow's comprehensive exams, which will be given in the orphan's shack. And you'd better do excellent work, or it's free ride from Coach Genghis. Sayonara, Baudelaire's. Sayonara is the Japanese word for goodbye, and I'm sure that each and every one of the millions of people who live in Japan would be ashamed to hear their language used by such a revolting person. But the Baudelaire orphans had no time to think such, such international thoughts. They were too busy giving the quagmire triplets the latest news. This is awful, Duncan cried as the five children trudged across the lawn so they could talk things over in peace. There's no way you can get an A on, no exam on those exams, particularly if you have to run laps tonight. Oh, this is dreadful, Isadora cried. There's no way you can make all those staples either. You'll be homeschooled before you know it. Coach Genghis won't homeschool us, Violet said, looking out at the front lawn where the luminous zero was waiting for them. He'll do something much, much worse. Don't you see? That's why he made us run all those laps. He knew we'd be exhausted. He knew we'd flunk our classes or fail to perform our secretarial duties. He knew we'd be expelled from Proofrock Prep, and then he could get, our, get his hands on us. Klaus groaned. We've been waiting for his plan to be made clear, and now it is, but it might be too late. It's not too late, Violet insisted. The comprehensive exams aren't until tomorrow morning. We must be able to figure out a plan by then. Plan, Sonny agreed. It'll have to be a complicated plan, Duncan said. We have to get Violet ready for Mr. Ramora's test and Klaus ready for Mrs. Bass's test. And we have to make staples, Isadora said, and the Baudelaire still have to run laps. And we have to stay awake, Klaus said. The children looked at one another, then out at the bright... and then out at the front lawn. The afternoon sun was shining brightly, but the five youngsters knew that soon it would set behind the tombstone-shaped buildings that it would be time for sore. They didn't have much time. Violet tied her hair up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes. 
Klaus polished his glasses and set them on his nose. Sunny scraped her teeth together to make sure they were sharp enough for any task ahead, and the two triplets took their notebooks out of their sweater pockets. Coach Genghis's evil plan had become clear through the prism of the Baudelaire and Quagmire experiences, and now they had to use their experience to make a plan of their own. It's the end of chapter 9. Let me catch up. I still don't know what curtains are. Welcome for lurking, Rob. I know! Almost ready for season two of Series of Unfortunate Events. Oh! You keep hearing things? Guess you should look? What, did, what, what was it? Did you find out? Dang, class took a chill pill. Oh, yeah, I, I live in uh, South Carolina. Ah, you live in England. Okay, cool. My bad place, but my bad place. Paper Mario! Thank you. Oh, that's fine, Reed, but yeah, um, just, uh, I have young kids that watch my channel a lot, um, and I myself am more of a PG kind of girl, so I just try to keep my channel as PG, you know, um, as possible, so, as far as, like, chat language goes, so. No sweat that you didn't know, you're brand new to the channel, so I appreciate you being here, um, so no sweat, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and that's cool, yeah, I mean, it's totally cool. Just trying to keep it clean for the kids. Thank you. Let me take a sip of my OJ. Whoa, look at this glass. Whoa, I don't have a face anymore. <laughs> There's so much green in my glass. Okay. Oh, that's so good. Okay. <clears throat> How you guys hanging in? Y'all ready for chapter 10? Chapter 10. I know. I do know what you're talking about, Tara. Orange juice. Orange juice. I was drinking some orange juice. Okay. Chapter 10. The three Baudelaire orphans and the two Quagmire triplets sat in the orphan's shack, which had never looked less unpleasant than it did now. All five children were wearing the noisy shoes Violet had invented, so the territorial crabs were nowhere to be seen. The salt had dried up the tri dripping tan fungus into a hard beige crust that was not particularly attractive, but at least it did not plop drops of fungus juice on the youngsters. Because the arrival of Coach Genghis had focused their energies on defeating his treachery, the five orphans hadn't done anything about the green walls with the pink hearts on them, but otherwise the orphan shack had become quite a bit less mountainous and quite a bit more mole-hilly since the Baudelaire's arrival. It still had a long way to go to be attractive and comfortable living quarters, but for thinking of a plan, it would do in a pinch. And the Baudelaire children were certainly in a pinch. If Violet, Klaus, and Sonny spent one more exhausting night running laps, they would flunk their comprehensive exams and secretarial assignment, and then Coach Genghis would whisk them away from Proofrock Prep, and as they thought of this, they could almost feel Genghis's bony fingers pinching the life right out of them. The Quagmire triplets were so worried about their friends that they felt pinched as well, even though they were not directly in danger, or so they thought, anyway. I can't believe we didn't figure out Coach Genghis's plan earlier, Isadora said mournfully, paging through her notebook. Duncan and I did all of this research and we still didn't figure it out. Don't feel badly, Klaus said. My sisters and I have had many encounters with Olaf and it's always difficult to figure out his scheme. We were trying to figure out the history of Count Olaf, Duncan said. The Prufrock Preparatory Library has a pretty good collection of old newspapers, and we thought if we could find out some of his other schemes, we might figure out this one. That's a good idea, Klaus said thoughtfully. I've never tried that. 
We figured that Olaf must have been an evil man even before he met you, Duncan continued. So we looked up things in old newspapers, but it was difficult to find too many articles because, as you know, he always uses a different name. But we found a person matching his description in the Bangkok Gazette who was arrested for strangling a bishop but escaped from prison in just ten minutes. That sounds like him, all right, Klaus said. And then, in the Verona Daily News, Duncan said, there was a man who had thrown a rich widow off a cliff. He had a tattoo of an eye on his ankle, but he had eluded authorities. And then we found a newspaper from your hometown that said, I don't mean to interrupt, Isadora said, but we'd better stop thinking about the past and start thinking about the present. Lunchtime is more than half over, and we desperately need a plan. You're not napping, are you? Klaus asked Violet, who'd been silent for a very long time. Of course I'm not napping, Violet replied. I'm concentrating. I think I can invent something to make all those staples Sunny needs. But I can't figure out how I can invent the device and study for the test at the same time. Since Sore began, I haven't taken good notes in Mr. Ramore's class, so I won't be able to remember his stories. Well, you don't have to worry about that, Duncan said, holding up his dark green notebook. I've written down every one of Mr. Ramore's stories. Every boring detail is recorded here in my notebook. And I've written down how long, wide, and deep all of Mrs. Bass's objects are, Isadora said, holding up her own notebook. You can study from my notebook, Klaus, and Violet can study from Duncan's. <clears throat> Thank you, Klaus said, but you're forgetting something. We're supposed to be running laps this evening. We don't have time to read anybody's notebook. Tarkor, Sunny said, which meant, you're right, of course. Sore always lasts until dawn, and the tests are first thing in the morning. If only we had one of the world's greatest inventor great inventors to help us, Violet said. I wonder what Nikola Tesla would do. Or one of the world's great journalists, Duncan said. I wonder what Dorothy Parker would do in this situation. And I wonder what Hammurabi, the ancient Babylonian, would do to help us, Klaus said. He was one of the world's greatest researchers. Or the great poet Lord Byron, Isadora said. Shark, Sunny said, rubbing her teeth thoughtfully. Who knows what any of those people or fish would do in our shoes, Violet said. It's impossible to know. Duncan snapped his fingers not to signal a waiter or because he was listening to catchy music, but because he had an idea. In our shoes, he said. That's it. What's it? Klaus asked. How will our noisy shoes help? No, no, Duncan said. Not the noisy shoes. I'm thinking about Coach Gingus's expensive running shoes that he said he couldn't take off because his feet were smelly. I bet they are smelly, Isadora said. I've noticed he doesn't, uh, bathe much. But that's not why he wears them, Violet said. He wears them for a disguise. Exactly, Duncan said. When you said in your shoes, it gave me an idea. I know you just meant in our shoes as an expression meaning in our situation, but what if someone else were actually in your shoes? What if we disguise ourselves as you? Then we could run laps and you could study for your comprehensive exam. Disguise yourselves as us? Klaus said. You two look exactly like each other, but you don't look anything like us. So what? Duncan said. It'll be dark tonight. When we watched you from the archway, all we could see were two shadowy figures running and one crawling. That's true, Isadora said. If I took the ribbon from your hair, Violet, and Duncan took Kla Klaus's glasses, we'd look enough like you that I bet Coach Gingis couldn't tell. And we could switch shoes so your running on the grass would sound exactly the same. Duncan said. But what about Sonny? Violet asked. There's no way two people could disguise themselves as three people. The quagmire triplets fell. If only Quigley were here, Duncan said. I just know he'd be willing to dress up as a baby if it meant helping you. What about a bag of flour? Isidore asked. Sonny's only about as big as a bag of flour. Nothing personal, Sonny. Donata, Sonny said, shrugging. We could snitch a bag from the cafeteria, Isadora said, and drag it alongside us as we ran. From a distance, it would probably look enough like Sonny to avoid suspicion. Being in each other's shoes seems like an extremely risky plan, Violet said. If it fails, not only are we in trouble, but you are as well, and who knows what Coach Genghis will do to you. This, as it turns out, was a question that would haunt the Baudelaire's for quite some time, but the Quagmires gave it barely a thought. Don't worry about that, Duncan said. The important thing is to keep you out of his clutches. It may be a risky plan, but we've been in each other's sh but being in each other's shoes is the only thing we've been able to think of. And we don't have time to waste thinking of anything else. <clears throat> Isadora added, We'd better hurry if we want to snitch the bag of flour and not be late for class. And we'll need a string or something so we can drag it along and make it look like Sunny crawling, Duncan said. And I'll need to snitch some things too, Violet said, for my staple-making invention. Nidop, Sonny said, which meant something along the lines of, then let's get moving. The five children walked out of the orphan shack, taking off their noisy shoes and putting on their regular shoes so they wouldn't make a lot of noise as they walked nervously across the lawn to the cafeteria. 
They were nervous because they were not supposed to be sneaking into the cafeteria or snitching things, and they were nervous because their plan was indeed a risky one. It is not a pleasant feeling, nervousness, and I would not wish for small children to be any more nervous than the Baudelaire's and the Quagmire's were as they walked toward the cafeteria in their regular shoes. But I must say that the children were not nervous enough. They didn't need to be more nervous about sneaking into the cafeteria, even though it was against the rules, or snitching things, even though that they didn't get caught. But they should have been more nervous about their plan and about what would happen that evening when the sun set on the brown lawn and the luminous circle began to glow. They should have been nervous now in their regular shoes about what would happen when they were in each other's. End of chapter 10. Oh, you're probably not here anymore, but thank you for stopping in, Reed. Hope to see you again soon. The bishop probably had it coming. <laughs> Tarkor, let's do some sweet parkour. I too would dress up as a baby to help out people. That's because you a nice dude. How's homework coming, Holland? Always be nervous. That's what I got from this chapter. Yep, moral of the story. <laughs> we have three more chapters, friends. I'm going to see how many pages. I have to do math. Hang on. I mean, sorry for saying that bad word. Oh. Yes, yes, go please make some soup for feeling better. Fifty-four pages. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Chapter eleven. <laughs> if you've ever dressed up for Halloween or attended a masquerade, you know that there is a certain thrill to wearing a disguise, a thrill that is half excitement and half danger. I once attended one of the famed masked balls hosted by the Duchess of Winnipeg, and it was one of the most exciting and dangerous evenings of my life. I was disguised as a bullfighter and slipped into the party while being pursued by the palace guards who were disguised as scorpions. The moment I entered the grand ballroom, I felt as if Lemony Snicket had disappeared. I was wearing clothes I had never worn before, a scarlet cape made of silk and a vest embroidered with gold thread and a skinny black mask, and it made me feel as if I were a different person. And because I felt like a different person, I dared to approach a woman I had been forbidden to approach for the rest of my life. She was alone on the veranda. The word veranda is a fancy term for a porch made of polished gray marble and costumed as a dragonfly with a glittering green mask and enormous silvery wings. As my pursuers scurried around the party trying to guess which guest was me, I slipped out onto the veranda and gave her the message I'd been trying to give her for 15 long and lonely years. "'Beatrice,' I cried, just as the scorpion spotted me. "'Count Olaf is—' "'I cannot go on. "'It makes me weep to think of that evening, "'and of the dark and desperate times that followed. "'And in the meantime, I'm sure you're curious "'what happened to the Baudelaire orphans "'and the Quagmire triplets after dinner that evening "'at Proof Rock Prep.' "'This is sort of exciting,' Duncan said, "'putting Klaus's glasses on his face. "'I know that we're doing this for serious reasons, "'but I'm excited anyway.' Isadora recited, trying, tying Violet's ribbon in her hair. It may not be particularly wise, but it's a thrill to be disguised. That's not a perfect poem, but it'll have to do under the circumstances. How do we look? The Baudelaire orphans took a step back and regarded the quagmires carefully. It was just after dinner, and the children were standing outside the orphan shack, hurriedly putting their risky plan into action. They had managed to sneak into the cafeteria and steal a sunny-sized bag of flour from the kitchen while the metal mask cafeteria workers' backs were turned. Violet had also snitched a fork, a few teaspoons of creamed spinach, and a small potato, all of which she needed for her invention. Now they had just a few moments before the Baudelaire's, or in this case the Quagmire's, in disguise, had to show up for sore. Duncan and Isadora handed over their notebooks so the Baudelaire's could study for their comprehensive exams and switched shoes so the Baudelaire's laps would sound exactly like the Baudelaire's. The, Quagmire, the Quagmire's. I did that backwards. So the Quagmire laps would sound exactly like the Baudelaire's. 
Now with only seconds to spare, the Baudelaire's looked over at the Quagmire's disguise and realized instantly just how risky this plan was. Isadora and Duncan Quagmire simply did not look very much like Violet and Klaus Baudelaire. Duncan's eyes were a different color than Klaus's, and Isadora had different hair from Violet's, even if it was tied up in a similar way. Being triplets, the Quagmires were the exact same height, but Violet was taller than Klaus because she was older, and there was no time to make small stilts for Isadora to mimic this height difference. But it wasn't really these small physical details that made the disguise so unconvincing. It was the simple fact that the Baudelaire's and the Quagmires were different people, and a hair ribbon, a pair of glasses, and some shoes couldn't turn them into one another any more than a woman disguised as a dragonfly can actually take wing and escape the disaster awaiting her. I know we don't look much like you, Duncan admitted after the Baudelaire's had been quiet for some time. But remember, it's quite dark on that front lawn. The only light is coming from the luminous circle. We'll be sure to keep our heads down when we're running so our faces won't give us away. We won't speak a word to Coach Genghis so our voices won't give us away, and we have your hair ribbon glasses and shoes so our accessories won't give us away either. We don't have to go through this through with this plan, Violet said quietly. We appreciate your help, but we don't have to try and fool Genghis. My siblings and I could just run away right now. We've gotten to be pretty good runners, so I think we'd have a good head start on Coach Genghis. We could call Mr. Poe from a payphone somewhere, Klaus said. Zubu, Sonny said, which meant or attend a different school under different names. Those plans don't have a chance of working, Isadora said. From what you've told us about Mr. Poe, he's never very helpful, and Count Olaf seems to find you wherever you go, so a different school wouldn't help either. This is our only chance, Duncan agreed. If you pass the exams without arousing... Genghis's suspicion you'll be out of danger and then we can focus our efforts on exposing the coach for who he really is I suppose you're right Violet said I just don't like this idea of putting your lives in such danger just to help us what are friends for Isadora said we're not going to attend some silly recital while you run laps to your doom you three were the first people at Prufrock Prep who weren't mean to us just for being orphans none of us have any family so we have to stick together at least let us go with you to the front lawn Klaus said. We'll spy on you from the archway and make sure you're fooling Coach Genghis. Duncan shook his head. You don't have time to spy on us, he said. You have to make staples out of those metal rods and study for two comprehensive exams. Oh, Isadora said suddenly. How will we drag this bag of flour along the track? We need a string or something. We could just kick it around the circle, Duncan said. No, 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 Klaus said. If Coach Genghis thinks you're kicking your baby sister, he'll know something is up. I know, Violet said. She leaned forward and put her hand on Duncan's chest, running her fingers along his thick wool sweater until she found what she was looking for, a loose thread. Carefully, she pulled, unraveling the sweater slightly until she had a long piece of yarn. Then she snapped it off and tied one end around the bag of flour. The other end she handed to Duncan. This should do it, she said. I'm sorry about your sweater. I'm sure you can invent a sewing machine, he said, when we're all out of danger. Well, we'd better go, Isadora. Coach Genghis will be waiting. Good luck with studying. Good luck with running laps, Klaus said. The Baudelaire's took a long look at their friends. They were reminded of the last time they saw their parents waving goodbye to them as they left for the beach. They had not known, of course, that it would be the last moment they would spend with their mother and father, and again and again, each of the Baudelaire's had gone back to that day in their lives, wishing that they had said something more than just a casual goodbye. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny looked at the two triplets and hoped that this was not such a time, a time when people they cared for would disappear from their lives forever. But what if it were? If we never see... Violet stopped, swallowed, and began again. If something goes wrong... Duncan took Violet's hands and looked right at her. Violet saw behind Klaus's glasses the serious look in Duncan's wide eyes. Nothing will go wrong, he said firmly, though of course he was wrong in that very moment. Nothing will go wrong at all. We'll see you in the morning, Baudelaire's. Isadora nodded solemnly and followed her brother and the bag of flour away from the orphan shack. The Baudelaire orphans watched them walk toward the front lawn until the triplets were merely, merely two specks, dragging another speck along with them. You know, Klaus said as they watched them, from a distance in the dim light, they do look a little bit like us. Abax, Sunny agreed. I hope so, Violet murmured. I hope so. But in the meantime, we'd better stop thinking about them and get started on our half of the plan. Let's put our noisy shoes on and go into the shack. I can't imagine how you're going to make staples, Klaus said, with only a fork, a few teaspoons of creamed spinach, and a small potato. That sounds more like the ingredients for a side dish than a staple-making device. I hope your inventing skills haven't been dulled by your lack of sleep. I don't think they have, Violet said. It's amazing how much energy you can have once you have a plan. Besides, my plan doesn't only involve the things I snitched. 
It involves one of the Orphan Shack crabs and our noisy shoes. Now when we all have our shoes on, please follow my instructions. The two younger Baudelaire's were quite puzzled at this, but they had learned long ago that when it came to inventions, Violet could be trusted absolutely. In the recent past, she had invented a grappling hook, a lock pick, and a signaling device, and now come hell or high water, an expression which here means using a fork, a few teaspoons of creamed spinach, a small potato, a live crab, and noisy shoes, she was going to invent a staple-making device. The three siblings put on their shoes and, following Violet's instructions, entered the shack. As usual, the tiny crabs were lounging around, taking advantage of their time alone in the shack when they wouldn't be frightened by loud noises. On most occasions, the Baudelaire's would stomp wildly on the floor when they entered the shack, and the crabs would scurry underneath the bales of hay and into other hiding places in the room. This time, however, Violet instructed her siblings to step on the floor in carefully arranged patterns so as to herd one of the grumpiest and biggest clawed crabs into a corner of the shack. While the other crabs scattered, this crab was trapped in a corner, afraid of the noisy shoes but with nowhere to hide from them. "'Good work,' Violet cried. "'Keep him in the corner, Sonny, while I ready the potato.' "'What's the potato for?' Klaus asked. "'As we know,' Violet explained as Sunny tapped her little feet this way and that to keep the crab in the corner. "'These crabs love to get their claws on our toes. "'I specifically snitched a potato that was toe-shaped. "'You see how it's curved in a sort of oval way "'and the little bumpy part here looks like a toenail?' "'You're right,' Klaus said. "'The resemblance is remarkable, but what does it have to do with staples?' "'Well, the metal rods that Nero gave us are very long "'and need to be cut cleanly.' into small staple sized pieces. While Sonny keeps the crab in the corner, I'm going to wave the potato at him. He or she, come to think of it, I don't know how to tell a boy crab from a girl crab. It's a boy, Klaus said, trust me. Well, he'll think it's a toe, Violet continued, and snap at it with his claws. At that instant, I'll yank the potato away and put a rod in its place. If I do it carefully enough, the crab should do a perfect job of slicing it up. And then what, Klaus asked. First things first, Violet replied firmly. Okay. Sonny, keep tapping those noisy shoes. I'm ready with the potato and rod number one. What can I do? Klaus asked. You can start studying for the comprehensive exams. Violet said, I couldn't possibly read all of Duncan's notes in just one night. While Sonny and I make the staples, you need to read Duncan and Isadora's notebooks, memorize the measurements from Mrs. Bass's class, and teach me all of Mr. Remore's stories. Roger, Klaus said. As you probably know, the middle Baudelaire was not referring to anybody named Roger. He was saying a man's name to indicate that he understood what Violet had said and would act accordingly. And over the course of the next two hours, that's exactly what he did. While Sunny used her noisy shoes to keep the crab in the corner, and Violet used the potato as a toe and the crab's claws as clean cutters, Klaus used the Quagmire's notebooks to study for the comprehensive exams, and everything worked the way it should. Sunny tapped her shoes so noisily that the crab remained trapped. Violet was so quick with the potato and metal rods that soon they were snipped into staple-sized pieces. And Klaus, although he had to squint because Duncan was wearing his glasses, read Isadora's measuring notes so carefully that before long he had memorized the length, width, and depth of just about everything. Violet asked me the measurements of the navy blue scarf, Klaus said, turning the notebook over so he couldn't peek. Violet yanked the potato away just in time, and the crab snipped off another bit of the metal rod. What are the measurements of the navy blue scarf, she asked. Two decimeters long, Klaus recited, nine centimeters wide, and four, four millimeters thick. It's boring, but it's correct. Sonny asked me the measurement of the, dar the bar of deodorant soap. The crab saw an opportunity to leave the corner, but Sonny was too quick for it. Soap? Sonny quizzed Klaus, tapping her tiny noisy shoes until the crab retreated. Eight centimeters by eight centimeters by eight centimeters, Klaus said promptly. That one's easy. You're doing great, you two. I bet that crab's going to be almost as tired as we are. No, Violet said, he's done. Let him go, Sonny. We have all the staple-sized pieces we need. I'm glad that part of the staple-making process is over. It's very nerve-wracking to tease a crab. What's next? Klaus asked as the crab scurried away from the most frightening moment of its life. Next, you teach me Mr. Remora's stories, Violet said, while Sonny and I bend these little bits of metal into the proper shape. Shablo, Sonny said, which meant something like, how are we going to do that? Watch, Violet said, and Sonny watched. While Klaus closed Isadora's black notebook and began paging through Duncan's dark green one, Violet took the glob of creamed spinach and mixed it in with a few pieces of stray hay and dust until it was a sticky, gluey mess. Then she placed this mess on the spiky end of the fork and stuck it to one of the bales of hay so the handle end of the fork hung over the side. She blew on the creamed spinach, stray hay, and dust mixture until it hardened. I always thought that Proofrock Prep's creamed spinach was awfully sticky, Violet explained, and then I realized it could be used as glue. 
And now we have a perfect method of making those tiny strips into staples. See, if I lay a strip across the handle of the fork, a tiny part of the strip hangs off each of the sides. Those are the parts that will go inside the paper when it's a staple. If I take off my noisy shoes, and here Violet paused to take off her noisy shoes, and use the metal ends to tap on the strips, they'll bend around the handle of the fork and turn into staples, see? Gaiba! Sunny shrieked, which meant, you're a genius, but how can I help? You can keep your noisy shoes on your feet, Violet replied, and keep the crabs away from us. And Klaus, you start summarizing stories. Roger, Sunny said. Roger, Klaus said, and once again, neither of them were referring to Roger. They meant once again that they understood what Violet had said and would act accordingly, and all three Baudelaire's acted accordingly for the rest of the night. Violet tapped away at the metal strips, and Klaus read out loud from Duncan's notebook, and Sunny stomped her noisy shoes. Soon the Baudelaire's had a pile of homemade staples on the floor, the details of Mr. Remora's stories in their brains, and not a single crab bothering them in the shack. And even with the threat of Coach Genghis hovering over them, the evening actually began to feel rather cozy. It reminded the Baudelaire's of evenings they had spent when their parents were alive in one of the living rooms in the Baudelaire mansion. Violet would often be tinkering away at some invention, while Klaus would often be reading and sharing the information he was learning, and Sunny would often be making loud noises. Of course, of course, Violet was never tinkering frantically at an invention that would save their lives, Klaus was never reading something so boring, and Sunny was never making loud noises to scare crabs, but nevertheless, as the night wore on, the Baudelaire's felt almost at home in the orphan's shack. And when the sky began to lighten with the first rays of dawn, the Baudelaire's began to feel a certain thrill that was quite different from the thrill of being in disguise. It was a thrill that I have never felt in my life, and it was a thrill that the Baudelaire's did not feel very often. But as the morning sun began to shine, the Baudelaire orphans felt the thrill of thinking your plan might work after all, and that perhaps they would eventually be as safe and happy as the evenings they remembered. It's the end of chapter 11. Let me catch up on the chat. Here. Oh, hey, Oxel. Hey, I did see the new series of unfortunate events trailer. I'm so hyped. I cannot wait. Welcome for joining Oxel. <laughs> what a yo-yo. <laughs> Terror. <laughs> Crab became a lobster halfway through for reasons. Cause dumb. Crabster. Lob crab. <laughs> Fly lob crab. Someday I'll look back at streams on V's YouTube and go, what was wrong with me? I'm too cool for you, baby. <laughs> Crabster Lobcrab was born. I don't know why you'd want to catch up. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here live! Yeah, I have two more chapters to read and then I'll be done with this book. And so, and then I'm not going to stream again. I was going to stream, uh, finish up Train because I restarted Train on stream on whatever day. Sunday? Was it Sunday? I, I don't remember. Um, anyway, I was going to finish that, but I'm going to wait until after your stream uh, so we don't overlap. Which is good because I need to fold all of the laundry that I washed today, so I'll just fold all of that while I'm at your stream. <clears throat> yeah, welcome for living. Welcome for welcoming. All right. Chapter 12. Assumptions are dangerous things to make, and like all dangerous things to make, bombs, for instance, or strawberry shortcake, if you make even the tiniest mistake, you can find yourself in terrible trouble. Making assumptions simply means believing things are a certain way with little or no evidence that shows you're correct, and you can see at once how this can lead to terrible trouble. For instance, one morning you might wake up and make the assumption that your bed was in the same place that it always was, even though you would have no real evidence that this was so. But when you got out of your bed, you might discover that it had floated out to sea, and now you would be in terrible trouble all because of the incorrect assumption that you'd made. You can see it's 
better not to make too many assumptions, particularly in the morning. The morning of the comprehensive exams, however, the Baudelaire orphans were so tired, not only from staying up all night studying and making staples, but also from nine consecutive nights of running laps, that they made plenty of assumptions, and every last one of them turned out to be incorrect. Well, that's the last staple, Violet said, stretching her tired muscles. I think we can safely assume Sunny won't lose her job. And you seem to know every detail of Mr. Ramora's stories as well as I know all of Mrs. Bass's measurements, Klaus said, rubbing his tired eyes. So I think we can safely assume we won't be expelled. Nilico, Sunny said, yawning her tired mouth. She meant something like, and we haven't seen either of the Quagmire triplets, so I think we can safely assume that their part of the plan went well. That's true, Klaus said. I assume that they'd been, if they'd been caught, we would have heard by now. I'd make the same assumption, Violet said. I'd make the same assumption, came a nasty mimicking voice, and the children were startled to see Vice Principal Nero standing behind them, holding a huge stack of papers. In addition to the assumptions they had made out loud, the Baudelaire's had made the assumption that they were alone, and they were surprised to find not only Vice Principal Nero, but also Mr. Ramora and Mrs. Bass waiting in the doorway of the orphan shack. I hope you've been studying all evening, Nero said, because I told your teachers to make these exams extra challenging, and the pieces of paper that the baby has to staple are very thick. Well, let's get started. Mr. Ramora and Mrs. Bass will take turns asking you questions until one of you gets an answer wrong, and then you flunk. Sunny will sit in the back and staple these papers into booklets of five, and if your homemade staples don't work perfectly, then you flunk. Well, a musical genius genius like myself doesn't have all day to oversee exams. I've missed too much practice time as it is. Let's begin. Nero threw the papers into a big heap on one of the bales of hay and the stapler right after it. Sunny crawled over as quickly as she could and began inserting the staples into the stapler and Klaus stood up still clutching the quagmire notebooks. Violet put her noisy shoes back on her feet and Mr. Ramora swallowed a bite of banana and asked his first question. In my story about the donkey, he said, how many miles did the donkey run? Six, Violet said promptly. Six, Nero mimicked. That can't be correct, can it, Mr. Mer Mr. Remora? Um, yes, actually, Mr. Remora said, taking another bite of banana. How wide, Mrs. Bass said to Klaus, was the book with the yellow cover? Nineteen centimeters, Klaus said immediately. Nineteen centimeters, Nero mocked. That's wrong, isn't it, Mrs. Bass? No, Mrs. Bass admitted. That's the right answer. We'll try another question, Mr. Remora. In my story about the mushroom, Mr. Ramora asked Violet, what was the name of the chef? Maurice, Violet answered. Maurice, Nero mimicked. Correct, Mr. Ramora said. How long was the chicken breast number seven, Mrs. Bass asked. Fourteen centimeters and five millimeters, Klaus said. Fourteen centimeters and five millimeters, Nero mimicked. That's right, Mrs. Bass said. You're actually both very good students, even if you've been sleeping through class lately. Stop all this chit-chat and flunk them. Nero said. I've never gotten to expel any students, and I was really looking forward to it. In my story about the dump truck, Mr. Ramora said, as Sunny began to staple the piles of thick papers into booklets, what color were the rocks that it carried? Gray and brown. Gray and brown. Correct. How deep was my mother's casserole dish? Six centimeters. Six centimeters. Correct. In my story about the weasel, what was its favorite color? The comprehensive exams went on and on, and if I were to repeat all of the tiresome and pointless questions that Mr. Ramora and Mrs. Bass asked, you might become so bored that you might go to sleep right here, using this book as a pillow instead of as an entertaining and instructive tale to benefit young minds. Indeed, the exams were so boring that the Baudelaire orphans might normally have dozed through the test themselves, but they dared not doze. One wrong answer or unstapled piece of paper, and Nero would expel them from Prufrock Preparatory School and send them into the waiting clutches of Coach Genghis, so the three children worked as hard as they could. Violet tried to remember each detail Klaus had taught her. Klaus tried to remember every measurement he had taught himself, and Sunny stapled like mad, a phrase which here means quickly and accurately. Finally, Mr. Ramora stopped in the middle of his eighth banana and turned to Vice Principal Nero. Nero, he said, there's no use continuing these exams. Violet is a very fine student and has obviously studied very hard. Mrs. Bass nodded her head in agreement. In all my years of teaching, I've never encountered a more metric-wise boy than Klaus here. And it looks like Sunny is a fine secretary as well. Look at these booklets. They're gorgeous. Pilso, Sunny shrieked. My sister means thank you very much, Violet said, although Sunny really meant something more like, my stapling hand is sore. Does this mean we get to stay at Prufrock Prep? Oh, let them stay, Nero, Mr. Ramora said. Why don't you expel that Carmelita Spatz? She never studies, and she's an awful person besides. 
Oh yes, Mrs. Bass said. Let's give her an extra challenging examination. I can't flunk Carmelita Spatz, Nero said impatiently. She's Coach Gingus's special messenger. Who? Mr. Ramora asked. You know, Mrs. Bass explained. Coach Gingus, the new gym teacher. Oh yes, Mr. Ramora said. I've heard about him, but I've never met him. What's he like? He is the finest gym teacher the world has ever seen, Vice Principal Nero said, shaking his four pigtails in amazement. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can see for yourself. Here he comes now. Nero pointed one of his hairy hands out of the orphan's shack, and the Bodler orphan saw with horror that the vice principal was speaking the truth. Whistling an irritating tune to himself, Coach Genghis was walking straight toward them, and the children could see at once how incorrect one of their assumptions had been. It was not the assumption that Sunny would not lose her job, although that assumption, assumption too, would turn out to be incorrect. And it was not the assumption that Violet and Klaus would not be expelled, although that, too, was a wrong one. It was the assumption about the quagmire triplets and their part of the plan going well. As Coach Genghis walked closer and closer, the Baudelaire saw that he was holding Violet's hair ribbon in one of his scraggly hands and Klaus's glasses in the other, and with every step of his expensive running shoes, the coach raised a small white cloud, which the children realized must be flour from the snitched sack. But more than the ribbon or the glasses or the small clouds of flour was the look in Genghis's eyes. As Coach Genghis reached the orphan's shack, his eyes were shining bright with triumph, as if he'd finally won a game that he'd been playing for a long, long time, and the Baudelaire orphans realized that the assumption about the Quagmire triplets had been very, very wrong indeed. End of chapter 12. I don't remember the last time I was productive. Like last night. Cropsters. I didn't even know donkeys could run. Uh, most animals can run in their way, right? You should make an emoji out of a crobster. My favorite emote on Twitch right now is Lul. <laughs> Salt is still pretty good, though. Makes me think about you all the time. Crobster. Terrobster? You sound like a mobster. An offspring. <laughs> that and beautiful. <laughs> Perfect. Such a beautiful girl's name. I did that thing where I saw not it's funny. Yeah, Lul is the best it right now is my favorite emote. Oh one more chapter, boys and girls. Things are turning out to be very unfortunate. Yeah, we do need a Vlul. <laughs> Somebody should just take a picture of me going. And I'll turn it. I'll have to like do my hair all nice and be like. <laughs> no, I like my emotes though. Maybe if I ever get partnered and I can make more than three emotes, but I doubt that'll ever happen. We'll see. <clears throat> okay. Last chapter. Chapter 13. Where are they? Violet cried as Coach Genghis stepped into the shack. What have you done with them? Normally, of course, one should begin conversations with something more along the lines of, Hello, how are you? But the eldest Baudelaire was far too, too distressed to do so. Genghis's eyes were shining as brightly as could be, but his voice was calm and pleasant. Here they are, he said, holding up the ribbon and glasses. I thought you might be worried about them, so I brought them over first thing in the morning. We don't mean these, them, Klaus said, taking the items from Genghis's scraggly hands. We mean them, them. I'm afraid I don't understand all of those thems, Coach Genghis said, shrugging at the adults. The orphans ran laps last night as part of my SOAR program, but they had to dash off in the morning to take their exams. In their hurry, Violet dropped her ribbon and Klaus dropped his glasses, but the baby... You know very well that's not what happened, Violet interrupted. Where are the quagmire triplets? What have you done with our friends? 
What have you done with our friends? Miss Vice Principal Nero said in his mocking tone. My eye is twitching and I don't know why. eyelid was twitching okay sorry stop talking nonsense orphans I'm afraid it's not nonsense Genghis said shaking his turbaned head and continuing his story as I was saying before the little girl interrupted me the baby didn't dash off with the other orphans she just sat there like a sack of flour so I walked over to her and I gave her a kick to get her moving excellent idea Nero said what a wonderful story this is and then what happened well at first it seemed like I'd kicked a big hole in the baby Genghis said, his eyes shining, which seemed lucky because Sunny was a terrible athlete and it would have been a blessing to put her out of her misery. Nero clapped his hands. I know just what you mean, Genghis. He said she's a terrible secretary as well. But she did all that stapling, R Mr. Ramora protested. Shut up and let the coach finish his story, Nero said. But when I looked down, Genghis continued, I saw I hadn't kicked a hole in the baby. I'd kicked a hole in a bag of flour. I'd been tricked. That's terrible, Nero cried. So I ran after Violet and Klaus, Genghis continued, and I found that they weren't Violet and Klaus after all, but those other two orphans, the twins. They're not twins, Violet cried. They're triplets. They're triplets, Nero mocked. Don't be an idiot. Triplets are when four babies are born at the same time, and there are only two quagmires. And these two quagmires were pretending to be the Baudelaire's in order to give the Baudelaire's extra time to study. Extra time to study, Nero said, grinning in delight. That's cheating. That's not cheating, Mrs. Bass said. Skipping gym class to study is cheating, Nero insisted. No, it's just good time management, Mr. Ramora argued. There's nothing wrong with athletics, but they shouldn't get in the way of your schoolwork. Look, I'm the vice principal, the vice principal said. I say the Baudelaire's were cheating, and therefore, hooray, I can expel them. You two are merely teachers, so if you disagree with me, I can, dis I can expel you too. Mr. Ramora looked at Mrs. Bass, and they both shrugged. You're the boss, Nero, Mr. Ramora said finally, taking another banana out of his pocket. If you say they're expelled, they're expelled. Well, I say they're expelled, Nero said, and Sunny loses her job too. Ranta, Sunny shrieked, which meant something along the lines of, I never wanted to work as a secretary anyway. We don't care about being expelled, Violet said. We want to know what happened to our friends. Well, the Quagmires had to be punished for their part in the cheating. Coach Genghis said, so I brought them over to the cafeteria and put those two workers in charge of them. They'll be whisking eggs all day long. Very sensible, Nero agreed. That's all they're doing, Klaus said suspiciously. Whisking eggs. That's what I said, Genghis said and leaned so close to the Baudelaire's that all they could see were his shiny eyes and crooked curve of his wicked mouth. Those two quagmires will whisk and whisk until they are simply whisked away. You're a liar, Violet said. Insulting your coach, Nero said, shaking his pigtailed head. Now you're doubly expelled. What's this? said a voice from a doorway. Doubly expelled? The voice stopped at a the voice stopped to have a long, wet cough, so the Baudelaire's knew without looking that it was Mr. Poe. He was standing at the orphan shack holding a large paper sack and looking busy and confused. What are all of you doing here? he said. This doesn't look like a proper place to have a conversation. This is an old shack. What are you doing here? Nero asked. We don't allow strangers to wander around Proofrock Preparatory School. Poe's the name, Mr. Poe said, shaking Nero's hand. You must be Nero. We've talked on the phone. I received your telegram about 28 bags of candy and the 10 pairs of earrings with precious stones. My associates at Multuary Money Management thought I'd better deliver them in person, so here I am. But what's this about? Expelled? These orphans you foisted on me, Nero said, using a nasty word for gave have proven to be terrible cheaters, and I'm forced to expel them. Cheaters, Mr. Poe said, frowning at the three siblings. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny, I'm very disappointed in you. You promised me that you'd be excellent students. Well, only Violet and Klaus were students, Nero said. Sunny was an administrative assistant, but she was terrible at that as well. Mr. Poe's eyes widened in surprise as he paused to cough into his white handkerchief. An administrative assistant, he repeated. But Sonny's only a baby. She should be in preschool, not in an office environment. It doesn't matter now, Nero said. They're all expelled. Give me the candy. Klaus looked down at his hands, which were still clutching the quagmire notebooks. He was afraid that the notebooks might be the only sign of the quagmires he would ever see again. We don't have any time to argue about candy, he cried. Count Olaf has done something terrible to our friends. Count Olaf, Mr. Poe said, handing Nero the paper sack. Don't tell me he's found you here. 
No, of course not, Nero said. My advanced computer system has kept him away, of course, but the children have this bizarre notion that Coach Genghis is really Count Olaf in disguise. Count, Count Olaf, Genghis said slowly. Yes, I've heard of him. He's supposed to be the best actor in the whole world, am I right? I'm the best gym leader in the whole, gym teacher in the whole world, so we couldn't possibly be the same person. Mr. Poe looked Coach Genghis up and down, then shook his head. A pleasure to meet you, he said, and turned to the Baudelaire's. Children, I'm surprised at you. Even without an advanced computer system, you should be able to tell that this man isn't Count Olaf. Count Olaf has only one eyebrow, and this man is wearing a turban. And Olaf has a tattoo of an eye on his ankle, and this man is wearing expensive running shoes. They're quite handsome, by the way. Oh, thank you, Coach Genghis said. Unfortunately, thanks to these children, they have flour all over them, but I'm sure it'll wash off. If he removes his turban and his shoes, Violet said impatiently, you'll be able to see that he's Olaf. We've been through this before, Nero said. He can't take off his running shoes because he's been exercising and his feet smell. And I can't take off my turban for religious reasons, Genghis added. You're not wearing a turban for religious reasons, Klaus said in disgust, and Sonny shrieked something in agreement. You're wearing it as a disguise. Please, Mr. Poe, make him take it off. Now, Klaus, Mr. Poe said sternly, you have to learn to be accepting of other cultures. I'm sorry, Coach Genghis, the children usually aren't pre prejudiced. That's quite all right, Genghis said. I'm very used to religious persecution. However, Mr. Poe continued after a brief coughing spell, I would ask you to remove your running shoes, if only to set the Baudelaire's minds at ease. I think it's, we can all stand a little smelliness if it's in the case of criminal justice. Smelly feet, Mrs. Bass said, wrinkling her nose. Ew, gross! I'm afraid I cannot take off my running shoes, Coach Genghis said, taking a step toward the door. I need them. Need them? Nero asked. For what? Coach Genghis took a long, long look at the three Baudelaire's and smiled a terrible toothy grin. For running, of course, he said, and ran out the door. The orphans were startled for a moment, not only because he had started running so suddenly, but also because it seemed he had given up so easily. After his long, elaborate plan, disguising himself as a gym teacher, forging forcing the Baudelaire's to run laps, getting them expelled. He was suddenly racing across the lawn without even glancing back at the children he'd been chasing for such a long time. The Baudelaire's stepped out of the orphan's shack and Coach Genghis turned back to sneer at them. Don't think I've given up on you, orphans, he called to them, but in the meantime, I have two little prisoners with a very nice fortune of their own. He began to run again, but not before pointing a bony finger across the lawn. The Baudelaire's gasped. At the far end of Prufrock Prep, they saw a long black car with dark smoke billowing out of its exhaust pipes. But the children were not gasping at air pollution. The two cafeteria workers were walking toward the car, but they had taken off their metal masks at last, and the three youngsters could see that they were the two powder-faced women who were comrades of Count Olaf. But this was not what the children were gasping at either, although it was a surprising and distressing turn of events. What they were gasping at was what each of the women was dragging toward the car. Each powder-faced woman was dragging one of the quagmire triplets, who were struggling desperately to get away. Put them in the back seat, Genghis called. I'll drive, hurry. What in the world is Coach Genghis doing with those children? Mr. Poe asked, frowning. The Baudelaire's did not even turn to Mr. Poe to try to explain. After all their sore training sessions, Violet, Klaus, and Sonny found that their leg muscles could respond instantly if they wanted, them, if they wanted to run and the Baudelaire orphans had never wanted to run more than they did right now. After them, Violet cried, and the children went after them. Violet ran, her hair flying wildly behind her. Klaus ran, not even bothering to drop the quagmire notebooks, and Sunny crawled as fast as her legs and hands could carry her. Mr. Poe gave a startled cough and began running after them, and Nero, Mr. Ramora, and Mrs. Bass began running after Mr. Poe. If you had been hiding behind the archway spying what was going on, you would have seen what looked like a strange race on the front lawn, with Coach Genghis running in front, the Baudelaire orphans right behind, and assorted adults huffing and puffing behind the children. But if you continued watching, you would have seen an exciting development in the race, a phrase which here means that the Baudelaire's were ganging on Genghis. The coach had much longer legs than the Baudelaire's, of course, but he had spent the last ten nights standing around blowing a whistle. The children had spent those nights running hundreds of laps around the luminous circle, and so their tiny strong legs, and in Sonny's case, arms, were overcoming Genghis's height advantage. I hate to pause at such a suspenseful part of the story, but I feel I must intrude and give you one last warning as we reach the end of this miserable tale. 
You were probably thinking as you read that the children were catching up to their enemy that perhaps this was the time in the lives of the Bodler orphans when this terrible villain would finally be caught and that perhaps the children would find some kind guardians that Violet Coughs and Sunny would spend the rest of their lives in relative happiness, possibly creating the printing business they had discussed with the Quagmires. And you're free to believe that this is how the story turns out, if you want. The last few events in this chapter of the Bodler orphans' lives are terribly unfortunate and quite terrifying, and so if you would prefer to ignore them entirely, you should put this book down now and think of a gentle ending to this horrible story. I have made a solemn promise to write the Baudelaire history exactly as it occurred, but you have made no such promise, at least as far as I know. And you do not need to endure the wretched ending of this story, and this is your very last chance to save yourself from the woeful knowledge of what happened next. Violet was the first to reach Coach Genghis, and she stretched her arm out as far as she could, grabbing part of his turban. Turbans, you probably know, consist of just one piece of cloth wrapped very tightly and in complicated way around someone's head. But Genghis had cheated, not knowing the proper way to tie a turban because he was wearing it as a disguise and not for religious reasons. He had merely wrapped it around his head the way you might wrap a towel around yourself when getting out of the shower, so when Violet grabbed the turban, it unraveled un immediately. She had been hoping that grabbing his turban would stop the coach from running, but all it did was leave her with a long piece of cloth in her hands. Coach Genghis kept running, his one eyebrow glistened with sweat over his shiny eye. Eyes. Look, Mr. Poe said, who was far behind the Baudelaire's but close enough to see. Genghis has only one eyebrow, like Count Olaf. Sunny was the next Baudelaire to reach Genghis, and because she was crawling on the ground, she was in a perfect position to attack his shoes. Using all four of her sharp teeth, she bit one pair of his shoelaces and then the other. The knots came undone immediately, leaving tiny bitten pieces of shoelace on the brown lawn. Sonny had been hoping that untying his shoes would make the coach trip, but Genghis merely stepped out of his shoes and kept running. Like many disgusting people, Coach Genghis was not wearing socks, so with each step, his eye tattoo glistening with sweat on his ankle. Look, Mr. Poe said, who was still too far to help but close enough to see. Genghis has an eye tattoo, like Count Olaf. In fact, I think he is Count Olaf. Of course he is, Violet cried, holding up the unraveled turban. Murd, Sunny shrieked, holding up a tiny piece of shoelace. She meant something like, this is what we have been trying to tell you. Klaus, however, did not say anything. He was putting all of his energy toward running, but he was not running toward the man we can finally call by his true name, Count Olaf. Klaus was running toward the car. The powder-faced women were just shoving the quagmires into the back seat, and he knew this might be the only chance to rescue them. Klaus! Klaus! Isadora cried as he reached the car. Klaus dropped the notebooks to the ground and grabbed his friend's hand. Help us! Hang on! Klaus cried and began to drag Isadora back out of the car. Without a word, one of the powder-faced women leaned forward and bit Klaus's hand, forcing him to let go of the triplet. The other powder-faced woman leaned across Is Isadora's lap and began pulling the car door closed. No! Klaus cried and grabbed the door handle. Back and forth, Klaus and Olaf's associate tugged on the door, forcing it halfway open and halfway shut. Klaus! Duncan cried from behind Isadora. Listen to me, Klaus! If anything goes wrong, nothing will go wrong! Klaus promised, pulling on the car door as hard as he could. You'll be out of here in a second! If anything goes wrong, Duncan said again, there's something you should know. When we were researching the history of Count Olaf, we found something dreadful. We can talk about it later! Klaus said, struggling with the door. Look in the notebooks, Isadora cried. The the first powder-faced woman put her hand over Isadora's mouth so she couldn't speak. Isadora turned her head roughly and slipped from the woman's grasp. The the powdery hand covered her mouth again. Hang on, Klaus crawled desperately. Hang on! Look in the notebooks! VFD! Duncan screamed, but the other woman's powdery hand covered his mouth before he could continue. What? Klaus asked. Duncan shook his head vigorously and freed himself from the woman's hand for just a moment. VFD! He managed to scream again, and that was the last Klaus heard. Count Olaf, who'd been running slower without his shoes, had reached the car, and with a deafening roar, he grabbed Klaus's hand and pried it loose from the car door. As the door slammed shut, Olaf kicked Klaus in the stomach, sending him falling to the ground and landing with a rough thump near the quagmire notebooks he'd dropped. The villain towered over Klaus and gave him a sickening smile, then leaned down, picked up the notebooks, and tucked them under his arm. No! Klaus screamed, but Count Olaf merely smiled, stepped into the front seat, and began driving away just as Violet and Sunny reached their brother. 
Clutching his stomach, Klaus stood up and tried to follow his sisters who were trying to chase the long black car. But Olaf was driving over the speed limit and it was simply impossible, and after a few yards the Baudelaire's had to stop. The quagmire triplets climbed over the powder-faced women and began to pound on the rear window of the car. Violet and Klaus and Sonny could not hear what the quagmires were screaming through the glass, they only saw their desperate and terrified faces. But then the powdery hands of Olaf's assistants grabbed them and pulled them back from the window. The faces of the quagmire triplets faded to nothing, and the Baudelaire saw nothing more as the car pulled away. "'We have to go after them!' Violet screamed, her face streaked with tears. She turned around to face Nero and Mr. Poe, who were pausing for breath on the edge of the lawn. "'We have to go after them!' "'I'll call the police!' Mr. Poe gasped, wiping his sweaty forehead with his handkerchief. They have an advanced computer system, too. They'll catch him. Where's the nearest phone, Nero? You can't use my phone, Poe, Nero said. You brought three terrible cheaters here, and now, thanks to you, my greatest gym teacher is gone and took two students with him. The Baudelaire's are triple expelled. Now see here, Nero, Poe said. Be reasonable. The Baudelaire sunk to the brown lawn, weeping with frustration and exhaustion. They paid no attention to the argument between Vice Principal Nero and Mr. Poe, because they knew from the prism of their experience that by the time the adults had decided on a course of action, Count Olaf would be long gone. This time Olaf had not merely escaped, but escaped with friends of theirs, and the Baudelaire's wept as they thought they might never see the triplets again. They were wrong about this, but they had no way of knowing they were wrong, and just imagining what Count Olaf might do to their dear, dear friends made them only weep harder. Violet wept, thinking of how kind the quagmires had been to her and her siblings upon the Baudelaire's arrival at this dreadful academy. Klaus wept, thinking of how the quagmires had risked their lives to help him and his sisters escape from Olaf's clutches, and Sunny wept, thinking of the research the quagmires had done and the information they hadn't had time to share with her and her, with her, and her siblings. The Baudelaire orphans hung on to one another and wept and wept while the adults argued endlessly behind them. Finally, as I'm sorry to say, Count Olaf forced the quagmires into puppy costumes so he could sneak them onto the airplane without anyone noticing. The Baudelaire's cried themselves out and just sat on the lawn together in weary silence. They looked up at the smooth gray stone of the tombstone buildings and at the arch with Prufrock Preparatory School in enormous black letters, and the motto, Momento Mori, printed beneath. They looked out at the edge of the lawn where Olaf had snatched the quagmire notebooks and they took long, long looks at one another. The Baudelaire's remembered, as I'm sure you remember, that in times of extreme stress, one can find energy hidden in even the most exhausted areas of the body, and Violet Klaus and Sunny felt that energy surge through them now. What did Duncan shout to you? Violet asked. What did he shout to you from the car about what was in the notebooks? VFD, Klaus said, but I don't know what that means. Seiju, Sunny said, which meant we have to find out. The older Baudelaire's look at, looked at their sister and nodded. Sonny was right. The children had to find out the secret of VFD and the dreadful thing the Quagmires had discovered. Perhaps it could help them rescue the two triplets. Perhaps it could bring Count Olaf to justice, and perhaps it could somehow make, the mis make clear the mysterious and deadly way that their lives had become so unfortunate. A morning breeze blew through the campus of Prufrock Preparatory School, rustling the brown lawn and knocking against the stone arch with the motto printed on it. Memento Mori. Remember, you will die. The Baudelaire orphans looked up at the motto and vowed that before they died, they would solve this dark and complicated mystery that cast a shadow over their lives. It's the end of the Austere Academy. Let me catch up. I'm glad you like the emotes. I really like my emotes. Yeah, you can only have three emotes if you're an affiliate. Um, once, if you are a partner, you get um, more emote slots opened up the more subscribers you have, I believe is how it works. Like, once you hit certain numbers of subscribers, it opens up new emote slots. <laughs> yeah, my eye was twitching. It was weird. The pondering. Ooh, you've been suspended from a class. What did I say today? You're having a tea Thursday? 
cup top. I am having a koala tea day, but I don't think you should make tea from koala. That's true, Tara. I've been hanging out with you guys. How could you not love me? <laughs> Winter <or> not. <laughs> I pay attention. I thought V was actually pausing. <laughs> v is pro improver. No. This singing is funny. Cropster. <laughs> Nailed it. My love from whack. Now it's not the time for that, Violet. Since when was this an ASMR stream? Since I started reading. Hi, Stuart. Good evening to you. I hope you're having a great one. Hello again, Brit. Whoa, you sure it says what that third book says? Yes. Applesauce for Osir Academy. My voice is cool, thank you. Oh, it's a tea that koalas can also enjoy. Okay, I can deal that. Can also enjoy and enjoy. Alright, so before I finish, <clears throat> there's always the little, like, preview for the next book. So I'm gonna read the preview for the next book. <clears throat> and then I'll wrap up my read stream. To my kind editor, please excuse this ridiculously fancy stationery. I'm writing to you from 667 Dark Avenue, and this is the only paper available in the neighborhood. My investigation of the Baudelaire orphan's stay in this wealthy and woeful place is finally complete. I only pray that the manuscript will reach you. Not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that, purchase a first-class one-way ticket on the second-to-last train out of the city. Instead of boarding the train, wait until it departs and climb down to the tracks to retrieve the complete summary of my investigation, entitled The Ursatz Elevator, as well as one of Jerome's neckties, a small photograph of Veblen Hall, a bottle of parsley soda, and the doorman's coat, so that Mr. Helquist can properly illustrate this terrible chapter in the Baudelaire's lives. Remember, you are my last hope that the tales of the Baudelaire orphans can finally be told to the general public. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. So that's the preview for book six, which I'm probably not going to read until after I read uh, The Treasure in the Royal Tower, Nancy Drew book. That'll be the next book stream that I do. All right. I hope you guys had fun. So it's 2.25. Um, if Oxel is still planning to stream, she should be streaming fairly soon, right? In the next 30 to 45 minutes, if I'm right. Um, so I am going to um take a, a longer break than i anticipated but that's fine um so i'm gonna take a break i'm gonna do fold a lot of laundry do some other chores i might vacuum because we need some vacuuming done um yeah i'll get people complaining on youtube that's true um <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna just be productive and uh i'll probably upload my streams all to youtube the ones i haven't done yet so i'll be doing that um, I'll be at Oxel's stream when she goes live, and then when she's done, I'll come back to finish up uh, Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon again, uh, since I'm doing my replays now. Speaking of, um, this is kind of a side note, it's not related to this book stream, however, um, these replays of my Na of Nancy Drew's, these re- the, like on stream replays of Nancy Drew's um, I'm not saving to YouTube so um, because I already have all of them on YouTube and I don't feel the need to have multiple streams of the same game um on youtube so these these are those will not be saved to youtube just so you guys know okay that sounds perfect oxel but no rush um but that that sounds like a pretty good plan to me so that being said uh you're welcome for the read stream i hope you guys enjoyed thank you so much for hanging out with me uh earlier today right now today and possibly later i hope to see you at oxel stream um and i will uh catch you guys later I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave you guys off with a little bit of music, um, and then I'll uh, catch you guys later. Take care of yourselves, and as always, much love from me to you. Bye. <laughs>